Good morning. This morning in our worship service, as we hear God's word, we're going to be reminded of the glory of God, the different ways he reveals it to us. And when when we think of God's glory, our minds oftentimes go to bright, shining light. But but today we'll be reminded the glory of God is really the, the love that he reveals to us, the love and compassion that isn't a bright, shining light, but boy, it's a light in our lives as it changes our lives. We'll see it in baptism. You won't see a bright shining light up here, but the love of God will be evident as the promise of God is kept and as the water and the word are used in that baptism. For our baptism this morning, you'll notice uh, Pastor Wenzel is here. He's the grandfather of this child, and so he's going to be performing the baptism. He was uh, previously a member here helping out at other congregations, has some duties in our synod, uh, but we're glad that he's able to be here to perform the baptism for us this morning. Uh, The order of service that we'll use, printed for you in your worship folder, except for the hymns. And so we'll begin with the opening hymn, which is hymn number 921, Come Thou Almighty King. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents, we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. In baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives. 
Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance, and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit and united us to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Every day God forgives your sins, removes your guilt, and strengthens you to defeat Satan's power. His promise is for you and your children, and he will never forsake you. Your sins are forgiven. You are clothed with Christ. You are at peace with God now and forever. Amen. The Gospel according to St. Mark. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Elishua Mark Wenzel, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Receive the sign of the cross both upon the forehead and over your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. May you be a blessing to all who meet you. May your name be a blessing to you and to all who meet you, a name that reminds you that God saves you and saves us. The almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has given you new birth of water and the spirit and has forgiven all your sins. May he strengthen you with his grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks, most merciful Father, that you have received Elishua as your own child and made him a member of Christ's body, the church. Now we pray, grant to him and to all your church on earth that being dead to sin, we may live to righteousness and being buried with Christ into his death, we may also share in his resurrection so that with all your saints we may inherit eternal life through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your one and only Son to be the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and believed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. For our first scripture reading, we hear God's word recorded for us in Isaiah chapter 62. God's talking to you. He's talking about glory that is revealed in you. About what the work of Christ means for you. That you are living a new life in which God is alive in you. You don't see it visibly with your eyes. You look like everyone else on earth. But the glory of Christ is in you through faith that you may serve your God. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. This is the word of our God. We will continue, uh, as it's printed in the worship folder, by singing together Psalm 145.
hear, we hear God's word from Ephesians chapter 3. I know what you hear here on a Sunday morning. For many of you is nothing new. That Jesus died for your sins. That you're going to be in heaven because of that. And that can become just church talk. Things we hear again and again. Paul reminds us here in this lesson of the glory of that message. Of the life-changing nature. That it is beyond measure how much God loves us. And what a great comfort that is for us as we live our lives in this world of troubles and setbacks and hardships to know that this love of God is beyond measure and that gigantic love is directed at you. Paul writes, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of our God. stand for our gospel lesson. This morning we hear the gospel of our Lord recorded for us in John chapter 2. I suppose we can't call them big and little miracles, but whatever the miracle, big or little, when you get to the end of this lesson, we're told why our Savior revealed his glory to us, so that we would believe in him, so that we would trust in him as the one who has most certainly saved us. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. They did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, then the cheaper wine, after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We will continue with hymn number 611.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of our triune God, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Andrew Carnegie and J.D. Rockefeller were two titans of American industry who had amassed vast fortunes during their lifetimes. And like many people who amass great wealth for themselves, they like to show off their wealth. Now these men also had a long-lasting and bitter rivalry with one another. So one of the ways they chose to show off their wealth was by buying each other Christmas presents for no other reason than to insult the other person. Rockefeller would often buy Carnegie a men's vest, but one that was made of paper. And he did this to rub Carnegie's nose in the fact that no matter how much money he amassed, he couldn't escape from the fact that he had grown up dirt poor. Carnegie, on the other hand, knowing that Rockefeller was a devout Baptist who didn't drink, would buy him a very expensive bottle of Irish whiskey. Now, this, the actions of these two men give us a snapshot into sinful human behavior. Unfortunately, many people who are gifted with wealth and power in this life can at time give in to their sinfulness and use that power and wealth to flaunt it and to serve their own selfish interests. That is the exact opposite of how Jesus chose to use his divine power and glory while he was on this earth. Christ often revealed his glory to strengthen the faith of his disciples to help those who are in need, and ultimately to die for the sins of the entire world. In our gospel lesson this morning, we hear how Christ uses the opportunity at the wedding of Cana to reveal his divine miraculous power to his disciples for the first time. Now, as we hear the story of the wedding of Cana, there are times that we often get distracted by some of the details in the story. We are fascinated by the idea that Jesus was the guest at a wedding and that he turned all of that water into that high-quality wine. But one of the details that we often overlook is that it seems from the account that most of the guests at that wedding had no idea that Jesus had actually performed a miracle. Now, the wedding of Cana takes place a short time after Jesus had been baptized by John at the River Jordan. He has now begun his public ministry, and he has started gathering disciples for himself. Some of his disciples, disciples had been followers of John the Baptist, and they had heard John's confession that Jesus was the Lamb of God who had come to take away the sins of the world. But they had not yet seen Jesus reveal his divine glory by performing miracles. And he now chooses this opportunity at Cana to reveal that power to his disciples. After all, who alone but the creator of the universe could take plain, ordinary water and turn it into that vast quantity of wine? And Jesus chose to display his power so that his disciples could now have no doubt that he was indeed the Son of God. And yet he chooses to reveal that power in a way that is powerful, but yet doesn't make a show or spectacle of his divine nature. And this is so often how our God chooses to, re to reveal himself to us. He reveals his glory to us through the power of his word. And it is because of that revelation that we become glorious. My friends, Jesus Christ chose to reveal his power and strengthen the faith of his disciples because he knew that he had just three short years to teach and instruct these men before he would suffer and die on the cross. He knew the kind of trials and struggles and persecution that these disciples would have as he sent them out to proclaim the message of his death and resurrection to the ends of the world. He knew that as they went out preaching the gospel message, they would face persecution and possibly even death. And he wanted them to have a sure foundation of faith that they could cling to as they spread the gospel throughout the world. He wanted to assure them that beyond a doubt, he was indeed the Son of God. 
and that the things he was teaching them about himself and about the nature of his Father in heaven were, in fact, the truth. And yet it does seem that this first miracle, he chose to reveal that glory only to his disciples and a few others. And it's remarkable how many times as we read through the Gospels, we see Jesus again and again instructing people not to tell others about the miracles that he has performed. Now this seems strange to us. We would assume that Jesus would want as many people as possible to hear about his miraculous power. But we hear later on in John why Jesus wanted people to keep his miracles more to themselves. In John chapter 6, we hear about the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus takes those five loaves of bread and those two small fish, and he changes that into a feast that is able to feed that vast crowd of people so they are able to eat their fill. But that crowd responds in an unfortunate way. Instead of responding in faith and thanksgiving, they look at Jesus and they want to set him up as their bread king. They become entirely focused on how Jesus can provide bread for them and fulfill their earthly desires. My friends, are there times that we, too, look at God this way? Do we not look as God to be our wish granter? Each and every one of us is a sinner who deserves only the wrath and punishment of our God in heaven. And yet again and again, we have the audacity to expect God to fulfill our every wish, want, and desire. We become almost solely focused on the things and concerns of this world. And we want God to come and intervene directly in our lives. We want God to fill those wishes, wants, and desires we want God to do things the way we think are best, not the way he knows are best. And we think to ourselves at times that God needs to answer our requests now in this way, how we think he should do it. And when God doesn't do the things that we want when we want them, we can grow angry and bitter towards our God. Now it is true that God has promised that he will daily provide for our physical and spiritual needs. But nowhere in the scriptures does he promise us that he will give us wealth and glory and success in this life. And God also has not promised that he will intervene miraculously in our lives. God expects us to be good stewards of the gifts that he has given to us and not to come to him expecting him to miraculously provide for us when we have squandered the blessings that he has given to us in his life. Miracles were rare, even in the Bible. And what God did choose to act through a miracle, it was to strengthen the faith of his people, to cause them to more fully rely on him and to help those in need, not simply to provide for their earthly wants and desires. When we see the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ's power at the wedding of Cana, we are seeing a revelation of his glorious love, not the power and wealth of an earthly king. God could have chosen any way that he wanted to to save us. But the glory that we have in Christ is to see that our Lord chose willingly to humble himself, to for a time set aside the full use of his divine power and to live as one of us. Christ humbled himself. He took upon himself our own humble and infirm flesh and made himself just like us so that he could live as one of us, so he could be tempted as one of us, so he could suffer as one of us, and so that ultimately he could die for us. The fact that Jesus did not make full use of his divine power while he was on this earth, but instead used it to help those who were in need and strengthen the faith of his disciples, magnifies the sacrifice he made for us on the cross. Because Jesus was true God, because he had that divine power, he could have at any moment chosen to get down off of that cross. But because he loved us so much, 
he willingly placed himself upon that cross for our sins. He willingly submitted to the torture and humiliation at the hands of Pilate's soldiers. He allowed himself to be nailed upon that cross. And then he willingly took upon himself all of our sins and suffered the torment and punishment that we deserved. This is the great love that Paul is describing for us in his letter to the Ephesians this morning when he wants us to know and comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love and to know how Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The revelation of Jesus' divine power at Cana assures us that Jesus was, in fact, the true Son of God. Because only God could come to this world and live a perfect life for us in our place. And it is only by the death of our God that our sins could be completely and totally paid for. But death could not hold back the power of our God. Three days later, Jesus burst forth glorious from his tomb on that first Easter morning, and he took back upon himself the full use of his divine power and glory. He shattered the power of death for us and sprung wide the gates of heaven for us and all other believers in his name. This is the powerful message and confidence that we can have knowing that Jesus is the true Son of God. That is why John tells us in his gospel, and the words that we sang this morning in our verse of the day, all of the miracles that are recorded for us in the scriptures assure us beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is in fact the Son of God, that his sacrifice for our sins was complete and total, and that he destroyed the power of death for us. As John says in his gospel, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. My friends, to the world, the cross seems like a picture of defeat. It does not seem like a symbol of victory. And the lives of Christians seem like lives that are devoid of the fun and pleasures of this world. But by faith, we understand that that cross is in fact a symbol of victory and of God's great love for us. Christ loved us so much that he was willing to sacrifice upon himself, sacrifice himself for us. And his death worked a great change within us. Our status before God has been changed. We are no longer enemies of God, but we are his own dear children and heirs of his glorious kingdom. Now we understand that the glory that we have received because of Christ's sacrifice is not the glory of this world. God has not promised that we are going to have success and wealth and power in this life. In fact, God has promised quite the opposite. God has told us that because of him, we will face persecution in this life and that all men will hate us because of the name of Jesus Christ. But by faith, we know that we are heirs of that glorious kingdom in heaven. And we can have confidence in this life as well, knowing that because we have been forgiven, we are God's own dear children. We can live at peace, knowing that our God does not see our many failings and sins. They have been completely removed by the blood of Christ. And we know that our reward is that glory that awaits us in heaven. And that our God, because of that sacrifice that Jesus made, will listen and hear and answer our prayers. The wedding at Cana also shows us the great and generous and gracious nature of our God. Jesus could have used any of a variety of miracles to re reveal his power to his disciples but he chose to act in such a way that strengthened their faith and also blessed that wedding couple. He saved them from the embarrassment of running out of wine at their wedding, and he also gave to them that great gift of all that wine that
that they could use for their enjoyment. My friends, this is how our God promises he will deal with us. He promises that he will continually and daily bless us. He will supply our physically and bodily needs, and he will rain down good gifts from above. When we stop and consider the great love of our God, when we consider all the ways that he has blessed us in our lives, we are quickly overwhelmed. And as Paul talked about in our lesson from Ephesians this morning, the gifts that our God gives to us are beyond our ability even to ask or imagine. When we stop and consider some of the things that we take for granted each day, we are quickly overwhelmed with just how much our God does for us. When we consider the force of gravity that holds us to this world, the air that we breathe, the rain that comes down from heaven, and we realize that all of these are gifts from our God. When we consider that joy and contentment we have, knowing that our sins are forgiven, and knowing that whatever vocation and occupation we have, we have been placed there by our God, and that everything we do, we are doing in service to him, and those are good deeds that make our God in heaven happy. At Cana, <coughs> we see a wonderful example of this faith in action through Mary. Now Mary has that problem of the wedding being about to run out of wine. And so in faith, she goes to her son Jesus and brings that request before him. And in the grand scheme of things, a wedding running out of wine is not that important. But it was important to her. Now she had never seen Jesus perform a miracle. But she had faith that he was true God. And because he was her God, he would hear and answer her request. In the same way, we can have confidence when we bring our prayers and requests to God, knowing that he hears us and will answer us. This is the amazing revelation of glory that we see at, of Christ at Canaan. This is the power of that great love that he has for us. And when we see that love at work in our lives, when we see the blessings of forgiveness and all the other blessings that God has showered upon us, we are overflowing with thanksgiving and joy. We want to go out and help and serve others and let that light and love of Christ that is in our hearts, that glory that we have, shine forth into the world so that others can see that light and come to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that they may share in our joy of knowing that our sins are forgiven and knowing that death no longer holds any sting for us. My friends, the revelation of Jesus' divine power at the wedding of Cana assured his disciples that he was indeed the true Son of God, that Lamb who had come to take away the sin of the world. In the same way, all of the miracles that are recorded for us in scriptures confirm to us that Jesus is our God, that his death on the cross did in fact pay for the sins of the entire world, and by his resurrection, he has opened wide the gates of heaven for us. And because he has won that change of status in us, because we are heirs of God's glorious kingdom, we can approach our God and Father in heaven with confidence knowing that he will hear and answer our prayers and daily and continually bless us. So let us go forth now, rejoicing in the knowledge that our Lord loves us and looking forward to that great and glorious day when our Lord will return, when he will reveal his glory to all the nations of this world and take us home to live with him in the eternal joy of heaven forever. Amen. We will now join together in confessing our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed, which you will find printed for you on page 11 in your worship folder. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, 
and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Receive these offerings and use them for the good of your holy church. Make all of us willing to give our entire lives to serving you. For you alone have saved us and you alone are the Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please stand for prayer. This morning in our prayers, we include a prayer on behalf of our uh, member and sister in faith, uh, Joanne Dvorak, whose daughter passed away uh, this past week, passed away suddenly, and so we'll pray that God would comfort that family. We pray. Gracious Father, in Jesus Christ and through faith in him, we approach you with freedom and confidence and trust that you will mercifully hear our prayer. As you revealed your glory at the wedding of Cana and as we celebrate throughout the Epiphany season, may that glory shine in the darkness of our hearts, drive far from us all fear and all doubts, and give us a, a new confidence each day to live as your children, trusting in you always. Bless the work of your church here and throughout the world. By your Holy Spirit, Make known far and wide the mystery of Christ Jesus. Give strength to all workers in your gospel ministry and bless the word that they proclaim, bringing those living in darkness into the light of your life. Remember missionaries and mission workers who bring the light of Christ to distant lands. Provide for their families and all their needs. Bless their work and continue to gather for yourselves people from the four corners of the world that they may live as your children of light. Renew our joy and give us new opportunities to make known the light of Christ. Lord God, we pray for all those who are sick or facing any trials in life. And this morning, we especially pray for our sister, Joanne Dvorak, that you would comfort her with the message of Jesus' death and resurrection, the assurance of salvation for all who believe, for her daughter as well. Strengthen Joanne in her faith, and comfort her during these difficult days. These and all our needs are known to you, gracious Father, and so mercifully hear our prayers. Guide us by the light of your word until that day comes when you will bring us home to yourself to join with people from every nation, tribe, people, and language, those redeemed by the blood of Jesus, that we may live in your glory forever. In his holy name we pray. Amen. And hear us, Lord, as we pray in Jesus' name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Amen. Before we begin the communion liturgy, just to uh, ask you to look ahead if you, if you haven't done so already. On page 16 is an announcement about our communion practice. We'd ask that only those who are members here uh, at Good Shepherds or other Lutheran churches in our fellowship come forward to receive the sacrament this morning. Uh, if that would mean that you're not going to be receiving the Lord's Supper today, please know we'd like for you to do it in the future. Uh, speak to myself or Pastor Zarling after the service. We'd, we would be delighted to tell you what's involved with becoming a member here. Also note uh, there on page 16, during the distribution of the sacrament, there are two hymns for the congregation to, to sing, hymn 386 and hymn 375. And so let us return to the communion liturgy on page 13 in your worship folder. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In the past, he spoke to us through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, who is the radiance of his glory. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The Lord is full of your glory. You are my God and I will exalt you. I will give you thanks for you and become a salvation. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this whenever you eat it in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. You can follow the directions of the usher as he directs you forward. Take a drink. 
This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Please stand. And now may this, the true body and true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life which is everlasting. Go in peace, for your sins are forgiven. Amen. We pray. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. be seated for the closing hymn, hymn number 584. Good morning again. A couple of quick announcements before we do that. Uh, welcome if you're visiting with us. Uh, glad you could be with us this morning. And there's a guest book out the back uh, on the table there. Hope you'll take a moment to sign that if you have the opportunity. Uh, the announcements to highlight, I don't have any to add, but I do. I just want to make sure you don't miss. We called a teacher on Tuesday evening, Catherine <coughs> Felgenhauer. Uh, don't get to say this about many teachers. She just got back into the United States yesterday. She and her husband had been I, I don't even know the whole story, but they had been working or serving with the Wells Mission in Zambia, Africa, and just flew back yesterday. So be praying for her as she considers the call to teach first and second grade for us here. Uh, also note, we've been talking about it last week. We had an insert about the, the merger uh, and the discussions that in a couple of weeks, on Sunday, February 6th, after the late service, we will have a presentation with more of the details for you. Uh, so please, please plan to come to that, uh, that uh, two, as I said, two weeks from today, uh, February 6th. Uh, then the, I guess the new one, no, I, I'm sorry, I need to highlight that we need church cleaners. I keep being told this. So if you're able to help clean the church, uh, contact the church office. We'll tell you what's entailed. It's not really that bad. <laughs> those of you who do it, right? So those of you who do it, it's not terrible, right? It's not terrible. See, you heard it. It's not a terrible thing. We'd love to have you help with that. We, we're running a little low, and so if we could have a few people volunteer to help with that, it would be much appreciated. And then finally, uh, 
Ladies, ignore what I'm about to say. Men, we're going to have a men's dinner Wednesday, February 2nd at Mission Barbecued out on Highway 100. It's right in front of Home Depot. If you're a man, you're supposed to know where Home Depot is on Highway 100. <laughs> so you know where that is. Uh, and all the men are invited to that. Just an evening of casual fellowship. Hope you'll be able to join us for that.